Hello there, it's Mazzy. Five UK artists, 10 UK albums, 10 almost original UK pressings. Maybe I did a slight um, clickbait with the title. I, these are near original pressings. But I just wanted to show, uh, I, I picked five, the, the five main bands in the 1960s who I consider the main bands. Now you can pick and choose and there are probably uh, some other bands that I might like as much or better than one or two here. But to me, these are the main bands. One, some may argue with, and that's a subjective thing, but it doesn't matter. This is my video. You're watching because you enjoy my presentations when I get all Anglophile because nine and a half years old, my life changed and the British invasion happened. And, and these bands, I'd say four out of the five of these bands literally changed my life musically and my tastes and evolved. And to this day, I can play these records. And I picked two from each artist and these are not necessarily my very favorites. Although in a couple cases, yes, there are some favorites. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the music, the artists. And let's start with this album, The Who. The Who My Generation, their first album. Uh, this is produced by Shel Tamley. And Shel Tamley was an, an American who uh, went just for like a short vacation for a short... Uh, few weeks. Was it five, six weeks? He was going to go to the UK and ended up staying there for almost the duration. I don't know that whole history, but he became a producer. He worked for DECA and then he worked on a lot of other labels and did some amazing things. He he produced the Kinks all day, all the night. And a lot of people don't know that Jimmy Page plays on that, but not the lead. Jimmy Page really played rhythm guitar when he was a session musician throughout the 60s. And she Shell brought him in. He plays a Rhythm and Dave Davies, uh, Dave Davis plays a lead on that. But we'll get to the Kinks in a little bit. But Sh Shell produced some of the most important albums of the nineteen mid the mid nineteen sixties, and this album um, is an amazing pop mod breakthrough record. One of the one of the best debut albums ever. And there were a lot of great debut albums in the UK in the nineteen sixties. And of course. You know, a lot of the bands were doing covers early on, and what's great about this is most of the tracks were original Pete Townsend tracks. There's um, Much Too Much and um, I'm a Man are the only uh, covers on here. I'm a Man, of course, we know. The great, great uh, Muddy Waters song. What a great, what a great record. What a great, great record. Now, of course, the kids are all right. The Kids Are Right is one of the perfect mod power pop songs before we called anything power pop. This is a mono early press, not the very first press. Uh, this is on. Um, this is a oh, this is a later press. I'm sorry. Ooh, Mia Culpa. This is a later press version. I just screwed this pooch on this whole video, but. Uh, this is a later press UK, so already Mazzy screwed up this video, but I promise that you'll, there will be originals. This is a later press, and oh my God, I am sorry, but it sounds good, and it was, uh, th then I guess this is into the 70s? Was this the 70s or early 80s? Now, it, God. Anyway, the album came out in 1965 originally, and they repressed a, an edition of the mono, so, <laughs> you know, I tried to be honest to my audience, but still, it's such a great record. My Generation, there there we go, okay. My Generation, The Kids All Right, two songs that epitomize uh, the 1960s mod sound of Pete Townsend and The Who, Roger Daltrey, Keith Moon, and, uh, and John Entwistle. Great, great thing. People try to put us down talking about My Generation. Now this is an early pressing. This is an album that Kit Lambert produced when uh, he started a label for The Who and with The Who track records. And this is my favorite Who album. 
I, I, I shift between this and Tommy. Tommy obviously is one, one of the early concepts. There's so many records that they call, oh, the first concept record. It's SF Sorrow. No, it's the Kinks. No, it's the Who. No, it's Sgt. Pepper. You know, people, the, the, the album thing in 1966, 67 was really changing. And um, thematic albums, whether they had a specific linear storyline like Tommy, were happening. I mean, the Beatles even admit, and John Lennon says, yeah, Sgt. Pepper starts out in this concept and just falls apart completely. And then we just throw everything we can uh, out there. But um, this is great because it's basically kind of a, a stab at commercialism. And they actually tried to sell ads. The true, the, who tried to sell the ads within these songs? And they just ended up creating these phony ads based on real products. And some people don't like those phony BBC ads, radio, you know, Radio London ads. Uh, bass string ads, uh, but what a great pop album cover. What a great album and track records, of course. Uh, Kid Lambert produced uh, this album with Pete Townsend, obviously close behind on them, but uh, it's a fantastic record. And I still argue that I Can See For Miles and Miles is probably one of many of uh, great singles of the 1960 and should have been a number one hit. I think Pete Townsend to this day is disappointed that this wasn't a number one hit. So this is not the first pressing. This is stereo. I think this is one of those albums that works better in stereo. I'm a stereo guy, even though I have some mono records here. I like stereo, even if it's wide panning stereo. To me, that's the point. I know in jazz, people feel differently. Uh, people want vocal centered, people want things centered, but that whole, you know, music, especially in the psychedelic era of 1967. Now, one of my top three bands of all time, two of which are included in this video, are the Kinks. Again, Shell Tell Me, Tell Me, T A L M Y, the American, uh, produce uh, this album. Now, this is face to face, this is 1966. This is the first album. The Kinks did that switch from that uh, R&B, a lot of cover sound. Um, this, I believe, was the first album with all original songs written by Ray Davis. And yes, and I keep saying this, it is Ray Davis. It is Ray Davis. That's his proper pronunciation, Ray and Dave Davis, even though it's spelled Davies. And I always say that because some wanker always makes that comment when he hasn't been watching me or uh, doesn't know the facts, ma'am. This is when they switched from that sound to more the sort of the Baroque pop into this, you know, getting into psychedelia. Some consider this the first concept album about suburbia and London life. And of course, this was the album when, this, uh, when the Kinks got banned after their union debacle in the U.S. They got banned from the U.S. for four years, I believe. A good four years. And, they're, and I, I'm convinced too, that the sound of the Kinks, the songwriting of Ray Davis, switched because of that fact that instead of being on the road, writing about Americana, writing about the blues, writing about the world, uh, he went inward and wrote about Muswell Hill and London and the suburbs and you know the quiet life in so many ways, uh, so-called quiet lies, and a pop sensibility of what was happening 66, 67 with Carnaby Street and Swing in London. They really epitomized that and probably wrote better about that than any other band of the time. Face to Face, Party Line, Dandy, the song on here, I remember, I heard this, I think the first version I heard was the Herman's Hermits cover. Mickey Most brought it over to the Herman's Hermits and they covered it. It had a pretty substantial hit and obviously the Kings didn't have a hit with Dandy. Too Much On My Mind, I'll never forget that song being used in the 1980s in the Vim Vendors film American Friend with Dennis Hopper and Bruno Ganz, uh, the second uh, film ever made about Thomas Ripley, you know, talented Mr. Ripley. And they used several kink songs. Vim Vendors, a big rock fan. And in the background, uh, when uh, Bruno Ganz's character is in his atelier as a framer, he's kind of mumbling and humming to, uh, to that great song, Too Much On My Mind by the Kinks. But, um, I would say, you know, Holiday in Waikiki is a fun song, but the key on here, the hit, is Sunny Afternoon, and really, again, uh, showcases that, that British suburbia, northern London uh, 
just, you know, within, without the outskirts of London. It's in London, but um, uh, Muswell Hill. What a great rate record. This has the fullback covers. Now, a lot of these, too, there were times when they were printing so many albums around this time of certain artists where you got the flip backs and sometimes you didn't get the flip backs. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But again, this isn't what this is about. Uh, this has the original Pi uh, logo and Pi Records logo. And, um, you know, the reprise records sound really good. But, you know, if you can get the Pi UK, I don't have them all, but I have a lot of them. This particular copy uh, I got, this is a stereo copy, but I got this from the Coleman Collection. Fantastic pop record. The other Kinks record, also from the Coleman Collection, because I got a lot of these Pi records. Coleman and I were both huge Kinks fans, and he was into the UK. He bought a lot of the UK stuff way before I did. You know, he's like, what, two years younger than me. He really kind of reached out to get the UK things. But this is something else by the Kinks. Uh, this is, this is I think, the last record Shell Talmy uh produced for the Kinks. After this, Ray Davis would produce everything himself. Ray's wife, Raysa, uh, sings. Uh, he, she's the background vocals on a lot of these early mid-period Kinks records. On the early Kinks and in the Who uh, that Shell produced, he brought in a great piano player we all know later, or some of us know, and you, if you don't know him, you should know uh, the, the great session work and keyboard playing of Nicky Hopkins. Great uh, English keyboard player. He worked with the Rolling Stones, with the George Harrison, with the Beatles. Well, not the Beatles, but with John Lennon on Imagine, All Things Must Pass. He played in, in the Bay Area. He lived in the Bay Area for a number of years with Quicksilver Messenger Service. And he played uh, with uh, the Jefferson Airplane. An amazing keyboard player and played on a lot of session work in the mid-60s. This is the 1967 uh, when everyone was doing pure psychedelic, theirs was still more popular psychedelic. And it has what I and many others feel arguably is the, the greatest kink song of all. One of the great, again, another great, great pop singles in the 1960s. But um, Waterloo Sunset, just that beginning car, guitar riff of uh, Dave Davis. It's kind of this now, 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 now. It's kind of a sloppy, twangy sound, which is so brilliant. The lyrics are beautiful. A funny face on here. Harry Rag, David Watts, Death, Death of a Clown. Uh, the Dave Davis, Dave, uh, one of his compositions. But David Watts, I mean, very pop, brilliant album. Again, something else by the Kinks uh, in their top five, definitely. Did I include it in my top five ranking? I don't remember, but um, what a great, great record. And this, again, is on that same uh, Pi label here, UK edition. God Save the Kinks. Uh, this is probably the one band that some might substitute and I don't have any of their UK originals except for this 1969 comp. And this is Autumn Stone. And this is the Small Faces. And I think for the last four years, there's rumors about an expanded reissue of this with outtakes. And this is a comp that was uh, released by uh, Immediate Records. And this was released a few months after the band split up. And some songs were going to be on their fourth album. All their uh, great singles, A-sides and B-sides. There's a couple of live tracks on here. And I would say, um, you know, Here Comes a Nice. Great, great, great. It's a drug song about a dealer. But um, to me, again, one of the greatest singles of all time, I say this, how many times can I say this, is on this record. And it's what I remember possibly is the first use, at least the first top hit, single use of phase shifting and that's the song Ichigo Park and this is a fantastic collection another record I got in the Coleman collection it's a UK copy um so good so good let's look take a look at this again look at that what a great band Steve Marriott one of the great uh blue-eyed soulful rock songs would leave this would start uh the band Humble Pie with uh Peter Frampton of course you got Ronnie Lane that stuck with it. They dropped the small. They got the tall guys, Ronnie Wood and Rod Stewart and the faces. Um, so small faces begat the faces. But, you know, in terms of 60s power pop, 
and rock and roll and some intense great rock and roll songs uh, this is such a wonderful collection hmm lazy sunday lazy sunday lazy sunday afternoon ronnie elaine had that sort of vaudevillian ballroom type of songwriting too um, another suggestion that kind of crosses over in the 70s uh Ronnie Lane and, and Pete Townsend's uh, collaboration album they did together is just, it's a perfect, a perfect record. So I guess that's all I need to say. There's a song on here called Wham Bam Thank You Ma'am. That ends up, and that's written by Steve Marriott. And supposedly he actually wrote it Wham Bam Thank You Man with an N, not ma'am, but they did a misprint on uh, this album version of it. So here comes a nice Lazy Sunday so many so many great songs they do two uh tim harden covers on here if i were a carpenter uh their song tin soldier is a great song too so this is uh i only picked one double album from them because i think they're an important band that should get more love great great um uk band of the 1960s and of course you can't you know the two powerhouses i'm going to end up with uh, obviously the rolling stones I'm going to start with. So here's Decca, Rolling Stones Decca. Both albums are produced by Andrew L Lloyd, Andrew Lug Oldham. And this is their first album uh, that he produced. This was recorded in the UK. This, um, and they're different variations. This is a mono pressing. In the very beginning, th th this hit at number one, and it was on the charts for quite a long time in 1964. And this record uh, did really well and they kept repressing it the early copies uh, some were the flap down you know we, we all know the uh the flap covers like this of course fold over covers but they also uh, they're pressing so many some of them actually the earlier cop pressings uh did have this pressing different printing companies were just pressing these left and right and putting them out the first um pressing of this, which I don't have. This is probably a second, maybe a third pressing. They were pressing so many in 1964. But um, the song, I think it's Honest I Do, they listed it, the title as Mona in this. They misprinted. Uh, so there are misprints on the very first album of this. But again, this is a mono version. These early Decca records sound great. And, uh, you know, if you're into American pressings of the Rolling Stones, you know, on here you had the blue and you had red labels. The red labels were the um, the mono versions. The blue labels were the stereo versions. In America, unfortunately, all the stereo early Stones albums were electronically altered for stereo. And I bought a lot of those at the time. So I have both mono and stereo of my American ones. But Deca, Deca ones and stereo. Deca stereo ones are really good, too. The cutting they used in the 1960s on Decca Records. So I have this in mono, but I have several other albums, including this next one. I think, personally, the Decca Stereo Aftermath. This is my favorite of the early period of Stones, the real 60s period. Amazing album. Now, this album was recorded by Andrew Luke Oldham as well, but this was recorded in the United States. The Stones, unlike the Beatles, would record several other albums around this period in the United States um, while they were sort of on tour. Again, Ian Stewart comes in and plays piano on here, same with Jack Nitsche on organ and harpsichord. This has Mother's Little Helper, Stupid Girl, Lady Jane, Under My Thumb, At a Time, a lot of songs that would become staples and, and, and assess what we know, what we think of, of the hits. All those are major hits. Now remember, Going Home, the long song, 11 minutes and 11 and a half minutes. That's just uh, a great kind of uh, end bit to side one. The American version had a different cover. This is, I think, the better of the two. And different track listing. So they, unlike the Beatles, the American versions and the UK versions have a very different uh, uh, track listings and cover art. And in the mono box that came out, which is a DSD digital transfer that... Um, came out several years ago, really done well, digital yet, sounds great, has both the mono and the stereo and the UK, I'm sorry, the mono box has, start again, Mazzy, 
I'm still recovering here a little bit. I'm still a little foggy. The mono box has both the stereo and American variations in that box, and they sound really good. But uh, these DECA records, I think, have de the DECA versions, the originals, have the edge over the mono box, because uh, all analog, again. All these records, of course, obviously, because of the time, are all analog records, and uh, some are worth a lot. I bought some myself. Some came from the Coleman collection. I picked them up all along, uh, along the last decades, um, and even in, in the 70s, I would get them when we got imports in. And lastly, except no substitute, from Liverpool, England, The Beatles, 1966. Now, this is an original mono revolver. What's interesting about this version, a lot of people don't know, unless you're a Beatle freak, and even there's a lot of people that know more about the specific every detail of song versions than I do. I kind of know peripherally, but I'm not going to confess or, or promote myself as I know every little version and variation off the top of my head. But this has an early version mix of Tomorrow Never Knows that was taken off the first pressing, the first couple of pressings. And I believe there's rumors that it was on 600 copies. There's rumors up to 60,000 copies. I tend to think there was more copies. It's a different version, a different mix of Tomorrow Never Knows, uh, that a different take maybe even. I, no, well, a different mix that is slightly longer, has more piano in the end, has more vocals up, and that's what this version is. So this has that um, that different version of Tomorrow Never Knows that was replaced soon after the first pressing, the first several, I don't know if it's several pressings, but early pressings, and they changed it. And I don't know all the reason why. Uh, there are bootlegs, there are versions of that available outright. This has the fullback cover stock that Garrett and Lofthouse did, the printing company in the UK at the time. The mono mix is very different uh, than the stereo mix of this, and of course, again, different than the American releases, because these songs that came to America had different mixes on them as well, and some of the songs. But of course, if you're a Revolver fan, you have to have the UK version. I consider this their best album. If you had to pick one album, which is really difficult, uh, this would be the album. And of course, we got um, the great Parlophone rec label, and this is the mono version of that. So, the Beatles. And lastly, this really bowled me over when I got it. This was a version from the Coleman collection that I got. Now, I have, a, I probably have 30 copies of Sgt. Pepper on vinyl, maybe more. And I have a lot of mono copies from uh, late 60s into the 70s, as well as the reissues. But um, this is one that came out of the Coleman collection. And I bought this album the day it came out, not this version, the American Stereo. And all my life, the stereo has been the one I love. I know the story the Beatles preferred everyone, George Martin, mono's a way to go with Sgt. Pepper. But to me, Maybe because I heard it first and I headphoned it and grew up with it. Psychedelic music and stereo has always been my favorite. So this, I always like the mono. And it's more of a tighter rock. And when you hear Sgt. Pepper and mono, a good mono uh, pressing, it's like a different album. It's more rock and roll, not as ethereal at times, not as stony. But when I heard this version, this is the Coleman ver early pressing, 1967, but not the first pressing. Um, I looked it up. The thing is, Beatles on discos are hard to figure out. This is a very close to original. It's in the first year. It does have the uh, cutout insert. It does not have, this version does not have the um, pink and white swirl inner sleeve. I have that on other versions. This album friggin' rocks. This copy is a bit noisy. The first album had a slightly wider spine. This spine, the second printing, is a little thinner. Uh, but this, oh my God, I learned this again. This album is a little noisy, but when I heard this, I finally got, and this is just in the last year, I finally got why people love the mono so much. Even 
despite the mono box of pepper and everything else, there's no touching this version. This blows away the mono box. If this was a clean, quiet sounding uh, pressing, I think the pressing was, but obviously this is, you know, 66 uh, year, 65 year old record well played it still sounds good and of course when the record is loud and you're playing it you don't hear some of that noise on it and but it's a fantastic record it's a it's a groundbreaking record of course the peter blake design cover michael cooper photograph george martin production uh, the ravi shankar influence and indian influence i think again that uh, within you without you when i heard this blew me away and i remember a lot of people young people didn't quite get that Indian classical thing. Some people even skipped it. But I think it's one of the most beautiful recordings the Beatles ever did. Certainly one of the most beautiful things George Harrison ever did. And of, and of course, the closing with uh, A Day in the Life, to me, is one of the most amazing recorded pieces of pop rock music ever. And this record basically helped create rock criticism, the professional rock criticism. When Time Magazine put these guys on the cover, Richard Avedon photographed him for Look Magazine, all of a sudden people started looking at rock music in a different way and rock and roll criticism began because of this album. So thanks for watching my UK journey uh, into 60s, early pressings, UK pressings. Love this music, love these records. And to me, these are classic records that everyone should have uh, in their collection if they're into pop and rock music and uh, British music. Thank you very much. Mazzy loves you again, finally, still.